David Bowie's fifth studio album, Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars, was a seminal moment in rock music and Bowie's breakthrough album. Bowie's biggest success until this point had been the single Space Oddity that was released just prior to the Apollo 11 landings. With hindsight, it was seen as something of a novelty and he never could quite match up to its popularity with subsequent releases. The album prior to Ziggy was Hunky Dory, now considered a classic also, but it hadn't even hit the shelves when work began on Ziggy at Trident Studios with co-producer Ken Scott. As a resident Trident engineer, Ken had worked with Bowie on Hunky Dory and they had a great working relationship. The band was pretty much the same also, minus Rick Waitman who left prior to the start of recording. The band members were Mick Ronson on guitar, Trevor Boulder on bass and Mick Woodmansey on drums. Mick Ronson also contributed to scoring and arranging the brass and orchestral parts. Bowie worked fast in the studio and recorded most of his vocals in a single take from the beginning to the end of the song. Ken Scott remarked that as much as 95% of his vocal performances were captured this way, including harmony parts also. Ken used both the Neumann U67 and AKG C12A at the same time, and then selected which tone complemented the track best, or even mixed both together. Bowie was well known for having his cultural finger on the pulse, and for this album, he wanted to go in a rockier direction after being influenced by bands such as the Velvet Underground and Iggy and the Stooges. In fact, Bowie said at the time that the concept of Ziggy was based on Iggy's character with the music of Lou Reed. He did later admit that Ziggy, the alien rock star, was initially inspired by the 60s American rock and roll singer Vince Taylor, who believed he was a cross between a god and an alien before his inevitable breakdown. Although the intention was to make a full-on rock album in comparison to his previous efforts, the acoustic guitar was very much present throughout the whole album. Ken Scott recalls one of the reasons for this. I wasn't into cymbals at this point, I have no idea why. So I used the high end of the acoustic as more of a percussive instrument, almost as a hi-hat sort of thing. It wasn't something we consciously thought of or went for, but it was always there. David's guitar of choice at the time was a Hagstrom or a Spania 12 string. Both models were made by the same company and just rebranded for different markets. It was a comparatively inexpensive model and definitely not the best available. It's also believed that Bowie had a blue Eggman guitar, the one he used for the famous Top of the Pops performance, but it was actually his Hagstrom Espana guitar, just painted blue. The guitar was mic'd up either with the U67 or the C12A, and compressed, sometimes quite heavily, with the Yori 1176 or LA-2A. The rock and roll edge was brought by Mick Ronson with his 68 Gibson Les Paul through a Marshall Major 200 watt amp. This 200 watt behemoth was actually nicknamed the Pig, but it did have the two KT-88 power tubes removed to reduce it to 100 watt. To get a more aggressive tone and more volume, he removed the pickup covers from the stock humbuckers on the Les Paul. It was originally a black beauty, but he stripped the paint believing it would make the guitar more resonant. He later let the Les Paul go with no reverence for its historical importance. It spent some time in the Hard Rock Cafe in Australia, but it's changed hands a few times since. Mixed pedals included the Tone Bender Mark I for fuzz, and crucially a cocked wah pedal. By cocked, I mean a wah pedal permanently engaged and slightly dipped to a point that tonally complemented the song and helped it emerge from the mix. <laughs> Another effect he used was the echo plex for delays, and the cabs were close mic with a U67, and occasionally a room mic was used depending on the mix. Trevor Boulder played his Gibson EB3 with flat round strings, quite often DI'd or through a 100 watt Marshall if he needed some grip. He was a big fan of the sound of Jack Bruce, so he'd use this Marshall to get the harder sounds when needed. Drummer Mick Woodmansey came to the first day of the Ziggy sessions with a bone to pick. He hated the sound of his drums on Honky Dory and said his toms sounded like cornflake packets and the snare like a packet of crisps. When he arrived the next day, he opened the door to the drum room and there on the floor were two cornflakes packets, a bag of crisps and a coffee cup for cymbals. Mick said. They were all mic'd up just as my kit had been. When I walked in I heard gales of laughter behind me. The drums were set up in the Trident drum booth. On occasion they were also recorded in stereo but not always. Sometimes they were all on one track with a separate kick track and sometimes the snare was on a separate track depending on the song. The drum mics were pretty much what Ken Scott uses today. Ribbon mics for overheads, either the Coles 4038 or the Bayer M on 60s, an AKG D20 on bass drum, a Neumann KM54 or 56 on the snare, 
and Neumann U67s on the toms. For the piano, he employed a three microphone technique, with two U67s on the bass and middle strings, and a KM56 for the high strings, all slightly limited with Uri LA2As. He placed the mics in parallel, directly hovering over the strings, left, centre and right. As with everything Bowie, there are lots of myths and misconceptions, and the so-called sax section on Suffragette City is certainly one of them. It's actually not a sax section at all, but a synthesizer, Ken said. We thought we'd finish the song, but as these things often go, it was lacking something. I've been spending a lot of time messing with the ARP 2500 synthesizer that Trident had recently purchased, and suggested we give it a try. I got the sound, and Mick Ronson played the part that David came up with. The album, like others that followed, was mixed on a 20-input Sound Techniques console using some board EQ, a single EMT plate reverb, and just a little compression on the overall mix. Compression came from two Yuri 1176s and two Teletronic LA2As. The multi-track machines were a 3M 16-track, and delay came from the Studer C37 stereo tape machine with a vary speed. The Sound Techniques desk is the original A-range desk at Trident. It's often mistakenly called the Trident A-range, the Trident A-Range was of course used at Trident, but at this point they were using the sound techniques. This particular desk was also used to record classic tracks by Queen, Elton John and the Beatles, with the exception of It Ain't Easy, which was recorded for the Hunky Dory album. The main first recording sessions was just a week, in which they had managed to record the majority of the songs. Drummer Mick Woodmansey remembers Bowie introducing the songs for the first time in the studio. We'd do the second take and think, now I know the song, and he'd go, that's the one. We'd all argue that we could do a better one, but he'd say, no, that's the one. After a while, we'd begin to think, we'd better get it right by the second take then. When the album was handed over to RCA, it included a cover of a Chuck Berry song they titled Round and Round. In fact, even the album's title at this stage was Round and Round. Although they were pleased with their album, unfortunately the record company didn't actually hear a single there. So back they went and cut Starman at the beginning of January 1972. The song was completed quickly, a day to record the basics and most of the overdubs, and a second day to finish the overdubs, including the strings, with another day to mix. The song finished up replacing Round and Round on the album, and the whole idea of the concept changed. Although considered a concept album, there isn't too much that links the tracks apart from how it's interpreted by the listener. The way the tracks were sequenced for the album gave it a concept feel. By the way, they almost segue into one another, and this was done by Ken Scott, keeping the listener interested, like a single performance. Despite not making the number one spot, it was a success, and paved the way for Bowie's iconic popular stage personification of Ziggy, and a performance on the UK's Top of the Pops brought David to the masses, and a star was truly born. <laughs> 